Hi, my name is Dr. Patricia Price, and I am a licensed psychologist in private practice in Rochester, Minnesota. And today I'm going to do my fourth episode in my series on eating disorders and their treatments. Um, today's topic is going to be myths and misconceptions about eating disorders. And um, I actually created this video earlier today and it ended up being 40 minutes. So I decided to uh, re-record at least the beginning of that um, and break it into smaller chunks that are more easily digestible and easier to watch. Um, so today I'm gonna just talk about a few of those myths and misconceptions. Uh, I'll start my talk with um, a set of disclosures that I will pull up on the screen here. Um, let's see if I can figure out how to do this. Um, basically, I, I would just like to disclose that um, I'm doing these education these videos for educational purposes only and not as a substitute for professional help. And I have some websites listed. Uh, if you you or a loved one would like to seek further information, my website is drpatriciaprice.com. Uh, the Academy of Eating Disorders has a great amount of resources on its website, aed.web, and the National Eating Disorder Association website is also great, nationaleatingdisorders.org, and below are my credentials. So in talking about um, the common misconceptions and uh, preconceived notions that people have about eating disorders, I think it's important to start um, with an understanding of where I think most of those preconceptions and uh, unhealthy, Ideals, ideas about eating disorders stems from. Um, and I was thinking about this and I think one of the, one of our biggest problems in Western society regarding eating disorders is that we tend to have a belief and we tend to be taught by society that we as individuals have the ability to decide to decide what our healthiest weight is. Um, and I think that is really at the root of the problem with uh, Western society. It's, it's a kind of akin to if society decided to um, have an ideal of six feet being the perfect height for health and everyone trying to accomplish being six feet tall. Uh, what even though their parents might be both five four and five three, or six four and six three, um, imagine if all of us were uh, told that being six foot tall is the healthiest thing to be, and that is the most beautiful place to be. And if you're not that height, then you're doing something wrong in your life and um, struggling our whole lives to get to that six feet. Um, that seem, that's obviously super crazy and people recognize that that's uh, not, not, a, uh, not a logical thing to, to go strive for. Um, and the problem is, is that weight for um, the last number of decades in particular has been viewed in that exact same light that, um, you know, society says, what our ideal weight should look like, what, what our reflection should look like in the mirror, um, what range is ideal, um, and really what dictates our healthiest weight is the exact same thing as what dictates our height. It's um, genetics, it's family, um, you know, if you have five, four parents and they're both five, four, you're pretty likely to be five, four or around that height, you're not likely to be seven feet tall. Um, and we're told from a very early age that, you know, we have a lot of control over where our weight ends up. And that is just a really unhealthy message. And um, I just wanna frame it in that, frame all of these myths and misconceptions under that 
umbrella um, that that's kind of messed up when you think about it. Um, we're taught that if you aren't a certain body type, you are defective, you are gluttonous, so you're lazy. If you're underweight and you're male and you're an athlete, you're not working out hard enough. If you are um, going through puberty and you're putting on weight quickly and you don't look like the other kids, there must be something wrong with you. Um, and there's just a lot of pressure. And so um, I'm beginning the section on myths and misconceptions with that because I think that those um, concepts really play into all the myths and misconceptions about eating, disordered eating, eating disorders. Um, and so I guess I'll bring up the very first big myth about eating disorders and that um, that is that eating disorders are a choice. Um, eating disorders are no longer thought to be a choice. Um, that was kind of the theory early on that, you know, if a kid had an eating disorder, it was purely on them to figure it out. And um, they got themselves into this mess, they can get it out. Um, I grew up in that era in the 80s and 90s where, um, you know, there wasn't thought to be good treatment. There wasn't good treatment for eating disorders. And, uh, you know, parents kind of, parents and physicians kind of were like, pull yourself up by the bootstraps and figure yourself out. Um, and parents were very looked down upon if they had a kid with an eating disorder. Uh, there was a lot of blame. Med medical physicians blamed parents. And there was a thing called parentectomy that they, they used early on in treatment where they believed the best thing for an eating disordered kid was to fully remove them from the parents, at least for a, a period of time. Um, so obviously this added to the stigma of having a kid with an eating disorder, having an eating disorder. Um, and so that is really one of the main myths right now. Um, and it, it's, it's been proven by research for the last number of decades that eating disorders are truly psychological disorders. Um, Re often related to other psychological disorders. Often they um, coexist with anxiety disorders, major depressive disorder, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, or obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Um, so there's often underlying psychological issues as well as the eating disorder. Um, but they are three pronged there's um, there's an opinion now that or there's research showing that eating disorders are really biopsychosocial disorders uh, in other words you're you you most people who develop eating disorders have a predisposition um, in other words they're born with I describe it as kind of a light switch in their head um, whether that light switch is flipped or not depends on their environment and um, sociology and uh, their socialization, their family environment, things that are said to them. Um, and, um, and I guess that is my message is that treatment needs to be multifaceted too. It's not just about um, changing one aspect or putting weight back on. Um, and I guess that leads me to the second uh, misconception is that people tend to think of eating disorders as just being about food and eating. Um, eating disorders are so per pervasive in a person's life. Um, you know, people wake up thinking about food. They go to bed thinking about food. Uh, eating disorders are really related to all aspects of a person's life. Um, eating disorder patients tend to be socially isolated. Um, they tend to have ide ideas about exercise. They're m about much more than just food. And once weight and um, eating are returned to normal and um, that's accomplished, there's therapy is not over at that point. 
that's usually uh, when the best therapy can begin because the patient can actually engage and figure out where um, where the eating disorder may have stemmed from in the first place. Um, I think that is about where I'm going to end this video and I'm going to pick up on the next one um, with more myths and misconceptions. If you have any questions, please let me know. I really would love feedback. Um, I've had a few questions, but not many out of these videos. And I really know that people do have questions. So um, feel free to email me at patty, P-A-T-T-I, at drpatriciaprice.com. And um, also you can find uh, my information on psychology today um, by Googling my name and Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, I look forward to doing more of these videos and have a great day. Thanks.